Hey guys, my name is Chris. If you're unfamiliar with the channel, uh, my partner and I are currently touring around Australia full time. Since I've been in Western Australia, I've taken up spearfishing and that was predominantly for food when coronavirus hit. Since I've been doing quite a lot of spearfishing in the, on the channel and in the videos, I've had quite a lot of people reach out who are keen to begin spearfishing, but they have no idea where to begin. Now, I am so far from an expert on this subject, it's not even funny. And basically, please don't think that this is me trying to encourage you to begin spearfishing. But if you are adamant on beginning and if it's something that you really want to take up, I really struggled at first to find out enough information online. And it really is a sport and a, and a hunting practice that has a huge learning curve. So if I can help in some way to do with either the gear or some tactics, uh, then that's why I wanted to make this video, okay? So please understand, I am very much a beginner. I am spearfishing a lot now, but I still suck in comparison to most people out there. So. Um, Bear that in mind, I am not the expert, but hopefully I can help because I've made a lot of mistakes with my gear choice. I've learned a huge amount in a very short space of time. So hopefully some of my mistakes will mean you don't have to make the same ones. Now, the reason I love spearfishing is not only that I can catch my own food, but I have a huge newfound respect for the ocean. It's been a new skill that I've loved picking up. I've learned a huge amount. It's helped me get over my fear of the ocean, but it's also helped me uh, understand and respect the animal kingdom out there in the water. So let's first of all, just go over the gear, okay? Now, all of what I'm gonna talk about today is to do with spearfishing from the shore. I do not spearfish from a boat and I would never consider spearfishing from a boat on my own. All of this is spearfishing on my own from the shore. Please understand it is incredibly dangerous. So if you're not prepared for that risk, this is not the sport for you. There are so many things that can go wrong. You could be hit by a boat while you're out there. You could drown. You could have shallow water blackout and therefore drown. You could get caught in fishing line and drown. You could get bitten by a shark, stung by poisonous jellyfish. Like there's all number of things that can go wrong. So it's something where you've really got to weigh up the risk over reward for this whole thing, okay? For me, uh, I really like the challenge and I do appreciate the risk involved as well. And for that, that makes the hunt more rewarding for me. If you are out there to massacre fish, I don't think you should be doing this either. I would like to think of us as all gentlemen. I've been really surprised at how supportive and amazing the spearfishing community is. It's more about taking only what you need, respecting the environment, taking out rubbish when you can. I think it's better than fishing in that there's no bycatch and that it is incredibly targeted. You will get some hate, so do, do expect that some people will not understand it. I've had a lot of hate from vegans and from animal lovers. I'm a huge animal lover myself and that I'm not out there just to kill things. I still feel bad when I shoot it, but I respect the animal I'm shooting and I eat it. And in my opinion, I think it is much more responsible of Ange and I to be eating fish that I have taken out of the food chain myself, that the animal hasn't suffered. I know where the animal is from and I know that it is from a sustainable source. All right, so before I waffle on too much, I wanna go over the gear.
Bye. All right, so this is all the gear that we carry in the car. So there is a lot of gear involved and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to make this video. When I started spear fishing, I basically went into a store and just grabbed everything that I needed and I spent a thousand Australian dollars. Since then I've upgraded a few bits and pieces. Some stuff I chose well, some stuff I chose really poorly. So, and I think the guy in the store really saw me coming from a mile away and just basically handed me a bunch of stuff. And unfortunately he didn't teach me anything. So I had to learn all of it on my own. So first of all, I'll go over my gun. All right, so this is the first and only gun I bought from the very beginning. It's seen much better days. It lives on top of our awning outside the entire time. It's our only, the only space we have for it in the truck. So uh, it is pretty beat to hell, but it still works absolutely fine. It is an Ocean Hunter 1300 millimeter rail gun. Railgun meaning the spear sits on top of a rail and that helps guide it off of the gun uh, nice and straight. So I've since gone through a few different pairs of rubbers, expect that that will happen. I'm now running some Rob Allen rubbers which are very, very strong. So this gun has more punching power than when I originally bought it. I have since now also just gone through one line as well that eventually snapped. That was very recently, so the original one lasted really well. Now, it's like any gun, you cannot aim it at someone. Do not point it anywhere where you cannot accidentally shoot it, for instance. So if you accidentally shoot it in the water, obviously you've got to make sure nothing happens. It doesn't go into your own leg or it doesn't shoot your mate or whatever. Be really careful, this would go right through someone. So it is an incredibly dangerous weapon. It has a safety like most guns have. And then other than that, it's a really simple design. Never load the gun out of water. That's the big no-no with spearing. Only ever load that gun in the water and unload it uh, before you come out of the water back onto land. I won't show you loading it, but You'll notice that a lot of uh, spearfishing wetsuits have a padded support here. That is for putting the gun on your chest and pulling the rubbers back. Now, when I first got this gun, it seemed impossible to load. So there is a trick to it. You basically grab the rubber with one hand and overhand grip and you pull until you can get the spear on your chest and then you can complete it by grabbing it with the other hand and pulling it all the way back. So therefore you'll load one rubber onto the first notch of your spear and that'll be the closest rubber to you. And then the furthest rubber away, you'll pull all the way back to the second notch on your spear. Now often I won't even load the second rubber. If I'm shooting small fish in close to shore, you don't need that power because it will blow right through the fish and uh, end up tangling on something or smacking into a rock, okay? Uh, now just briefly, this has seen better days, but you've got a flopper. The idea is this penetrates the fish and the flopper opens and then as you're pulling the fish in or spear, this flopper stays open and the fish cannot get off of it, okay? I'll just go over quickly loading it. So let's say we've shot the spear, it's pulled out, it's come out and it's over that way. Now, you've got your line here. You've got roughly four meters of shooting distance, anything past that and you're gonna basically run out of line. Now what you want to do is grab your gun, this will be ideally underwater, and this is one of the things I found the most frustrating about learning how to spear, is I had no idea even how to load a gun. They're all slightly different, but mostly the same. So I grab my rubbers and make sure they're on top of my gun. I then, this would be much easier because you'd be underwater, so this line would be floating, but you grab your spear with a bit of line, you make sure the loop is on the top of the spear and then you thread it under between the rubbers you push that in hard so you can hear it click try and make sure your line is on top of 
the spear like so. It wraps under into this little catch here, as you can see, but some guns will wrap over the top. Okay, so it'll depend on your one, but it's all very similar. That'll wrap through here, and then all the way down, you'll have a catch. Some spears will thread through a little plastic loop here. This one sits on top of these catches here. I've just mounted a little GoPro just by some electrical tape and a zip tie, just so I can film what I'm doing. And there's your gun. Now, I really think this was overkill for me when I was just beginning, uh, and I could have used a much smaller gun. Now that I'm going after larger fish, uh, this gun does have a huge amount of stopping power, and it's been really good. I've never actually lost a fish due to my line snapping or anything like that. But just bear in mind that it can be a bit of weight in the water to be moving about with. And if you're trying to duck in and around rocks and reef, this is very long. I would probably say if you're starting out, get a 1.1 meter gun. I do like the rail gun, uh, but the 1.3 is a little bit overkill. I'll leave that up to you. Okay, so now moving on to your float and line. The main reason for a float is so that boats can see you. Because if you're diving down, you wear all black or whatnot, you can't expect a boat that's ripping along to be able to see you, and that actually kills more spear fishermen than sharks or drowning or anything like that. It's actually being hit by boats. So they are really annoying things. So like I've got a real hate relationship with a float in line, but unfortunately it's just one of those things you've got to deal with uh, when you're spearing from the shore. So I have an inflatable ocean hunter float. If you've got the room and you can handle the weight, I would definitely recommend you actually get a, like a, a proper hard one, but a little bit smaller than this. It usually comes with a flag so that it sticks out of the water and a boat can see you. I found this one, as soon as the flag went up, it just sat in the water like that. It didn't actually work for me at all. But that's okay. Now, normally your float would just come with some, some rope line. I immediately upgraded that when I first got this float to a, uh, a synthetic uh, line that's in like a, a plastic sheath. Now, one end of the line obviously attaches to your float. I have tied up a little bit of my line because it was too long just with zip ties, and I know I can either pull that out underwater if I needed to, or I can cut through it with my knife, but it was just because it was just excessively long. Now you've got the spool, one end of that, this here, attaches to your gun via this tuna clip. Push in, there you are there, okay? Now the annoying thing is if you're in strong swell, this float will be dragging you back sometimes and pulling you around a bit and it's a, a quite an annoying claustrophobic feeling. I've also had it caught around rocks and had to go back and retrieve it. I've had it tried to drown me once on Dirk Hartog. I got completely wrapped around me and underneath a reef while I was being smashed by waves. So it's just something to be aware of, but again, it, like it's more of a safety thing. Also, in a pinch, if you suddenly became incredibly exhausted, you could probably hold on to your float for a little bit of buoyancy, a bit like a life raft. So I think that is kind of handy. And the other big reason for a float is that you can tie your fish to it. So if you're in somewhere like I am in Western Australia, we've got a lot of sharks in the water. So you never want to be attaching fish to your belt. Now what you want to do is once you've shot your fish, you've retrieved it on the end of your spear. Before you pull the fish off your spear, you will want to pull this off uh, the end of your spear and thread this under the gill plate of the fish and poke it out of its mouth, okay? So you had basically tied the fish off. Then you can attach this back to your gun and push the fish down to the end of the line. Now the idea behind that is not only do you have somewhere to store your fish while you're out in the water, but you've gotten that fish as far away from you as possible. So that if a shark came up knowing that there was an easy meal, it would be eating at the fish, it wouldn't be up on you, okay? But in my opinion, when you're in really sharky waters, which I am a lot of the time, 
I will usually just get one fish and I will get straight out of the water and I will deal with the fish before I get back in. I won't be trailing basically a smorgasbord for sharks around in the water. I also, uh, in the back of my mind, think that it is a little bit irresponsible as well because what you're doing is basically teaching sharks in that area that humans are basically just carrying food around for them. And I don't think that's very smart. So um, I like to get out of the water when I can, okay? But that is basically what a float and line is for. Next on the long list is a, a weight belt. I really highly recommend getting a belt with a buckle. At first I got a bright yellow nylon one which was really cheap and it kind of threaded through itself but it would come undone in the water and I ended up replacing it for this one. So spend a little bit of money on your belt because ideally you won't need to go through another one again. Now as you can see it's got some small weights on it. That is because when you don your wetsuit and all your gear, you will be positively buoyant. And that is very frustrating when you're trying to dive down for fish, you'll be fighting your own buoyancy. Now, this is a bit of a trial and error. I originally only had two weights and then I moved up to three. At a pinch, I could probably have another half weight. Please do not make yourself negatively buoyant in shallow water. You only really want to become negatively buoyant in like 15 meters of water depth because that's literally when, say you went unconscious, you would just sink to the bottom of the seafloor. Now you do want to still be buoyant, but that can be a bit of a pain if you're in very shallow water. Just realize you're going to have to sometimes fight that positive buoyancy. So that's the purpose of a weight belt. So next up, mask and snorkel. Obviously very straightforward. Uh, you're looking for a mask with a small amount of air volume. So quite a shallow mask is what you're after. That means you won't get that painful pressurized feeling when you dive down. You might still get a little bit if your mask is really tight, but a heap of volume in that mask, like a, like a cheap snorkeling mask, can be very, very painful. Basic snorkel with that mask. I almost wish I'd got one where you could have the little GoPro mount on top. That's something I wish I'd looked into. On the back here, I've got some shark eyes. And that's the idea is to stop sharks from uh, ambushing you from behind because they think you're looking at it. Don't know if that works. I haven't been attacked. Fingers crossed. Next is fins. So these are the ones I spent a little bit of money on. These are the Rob, uh, Rob Allen Evolutions. So in my opinion, I think the longer fins are better because then you don't need to use as much energy getting around in the water. You can get much shorter ones and also ones that have an open foot pocket. I haven't used those, so I can't really verify what they would be like. The only problem with this is if you're in very shallow water, they, you can find they'll start knocking around on coral and reef and stuff like that. And you really want to be careful that you're not smashing coral to bits when you're out there. But um, pretty straightforward. You can spend a huge amount of money on fins and then they have a detachable blade and different size foot pockets and whatnot. Uh, but so far I've found these absolutely excellent and really, really durable. And these stay on the outside of the car as well and they're still doing fine. Okay, now onto the wetsuit. This was something, this is the first wetsuit, uh, wetsuit I've ever owned in my life. It is a three mil wetsuit. This is called a steamer, so long arms, long legs. Since I bought it, I have torn it to shreds. So it now has a bunch of holes in it. And I must admit, I am so glad I didn't fork out for a really expensive wetsuit because it would probably be ruined by now. Now I think if I buy a wetsuit, I'd be able to tread it a lot better. It has a spongy padded front, like I said earlier, for loading your gun on. And I do really highly recommend that because loading a gun just straight on your sternum is actually really painful. It's only a three mil. It'll depend on your climate, but I really wish I'd got a five mil. I'm not carrying a huge amount of body fat and I think I am a little bit of a pansy. So I often find the water can be very cold. Now it's not a huge deal if the water's cold, but I will find that I will tense up, not enjoy myself. And when you start to tense up, your muscles burn through more oxygen and therefore you can't actually hold your breath for as long. So you do ideally wanna be warm in the water. I will upgrade to a five mil wetsuit. Now, because this steamer didn't come with a hood, I later bought a vest, which did, and that gives me like an extra sort of one mil of thickness around my torso. And I do really rate the hood because you lose so much heat out of your head. 
but at first I felt very claustrophobic in it. It's just something you gotta get used to. But overall, I would recommend from the start buying a wetsuit that's not incredibly expensive, but does have a hood on it. Very briefly, we've got our booties and we've got our gloves. Now these are, these are ones that are basically a, a very much a wear item. So you will go through a couple of sets of these in no time. Nothing I can really recommend other than the booties. Ideally you want something with quite a tough bottom because if you walk around on sand or any rock, you'll tear straight through them really fast. The gloves, you'll probably poke holes in them from your own knife, from sea urchins, from coral, all kinds of stuff. So um, just be aware that that's something you're probably gonna run through. Just briefly, you want to at all times carry a knife with you. A lot of them are very similar, but I would highly recommend you get one that's very pointy, almost like a stiletto knife. Okay, that goes in there. Now some divers will carry them on their legs, some divers will carry it on their arm. I've had a few different knives that I've already run through and always the rubber straps always seem to snap really quickly. So I've ended up actually just putting it on my belt so it actually sits here on my waist and now there's nothing that can snap underwater or get tied up. And so far it's a bit awkward to get to but I really prefer not having to worry about straps breaking and stuff the whole time. So my, in my opinion, have them on your belt if you can. You always want to bring a knife just for a few different reasons. First reason is you want that nice pointy knife so that you can brain a fish. When you shoot it, nine times out of ten you won't have killed that fish with that spear. You want to as quickly as possible reel that fish in. Don't tug it too hard because it'll end up pulling right out of the spear. So reel it in, grab the fish with me, my left hand. I will try and grab it underneath the gills so that it can't go anywhere. Being aware that a lot of fish have very spiky spines and they will stab you and they do really hurt. So grab the fish under the gills, it will take you a bit to get used to that. Certainly took me a long time to get used to and it's quite surprising how strong a fish can be and how slimy they are. So grab the fish under the gill and then you want to get your knife out and you want to put that knife behind the eye of the fish and slightly above. Stab it in there, there will usually be a slightly soft part. The idea is that you get to the brain. So you stab it in and you twist the knife. You'll know if you've hit the right spot because often the fish will shudder and usually its mouth will open limp and you know you've hit the brain. It is now brain dead. You've taken that fish out of its misery and you've also stopped it from thrashing about too much and that does uh, get sharks in the nearby area to get really interested in you. The other places you can hit it behind the eyes and stab it down and under, trying to get to that brain. I made a few mistakes at the start when I got the larger fish, things like uh, groper and whatnot. Just trying to stab it between the eyes from the top, that skull is very thick and that can be uh, really impossible to do and all you're doing is just putting a whole bunch of misery on that fish. So make sure you dispatch that fish as quickly as you can. Now the other reason for the knife is so that you can cut through um, any fishing line that might wrap around you. I've never had that happen, but I have cut out lots of rubbish and, uh, and rope from in the water just to get it out of the ocean. That's where a knife helps as well. And finally you want somewhere to store all your gear. Because I'm going from the shore and we're always on the road, I actually find often I'll have to hike to a spot. So that's where I've found having an actual dry backpack has worked really, really good. So I got this one from Spora Sub, or you could just have a dry bag, but really you want somewhere that's not going to get everything else you're carrying soaking wet with salty water. That's basically all the gear you're going to need. Uh, you can really go to town and spend a huge amount of money, but just be aware that I personally wouldn't spend heaps of money on your first go through with some of this gear because it's not something that you're going to keep forever. You will wear through it. But yeah, let me know if you've got any questions uh, in the comments about gear or, you know, maybe what I could improve on. All right, now that I've gone over the gear, I just want to briefly talk about some tips that I can give you just from what I've learned, from the mistakes I've made, or even just from stuff I've seen online, read about, or heard from other more experienced sparrows than I. So first up, uh, what I did when I began was I immediately downloaded an apnea trainer. I think my one's actually called freediving trainer. And you can do two tables. One is an O2 table and one is a CO2 table. Ideally do those every night, maybe before bed, do them a couple of times a day if you can. I'm really poor with developing good habits, so I don't do this nearly enough. 
but basically you want to get your body used to the buildup of CO2. That's when your body, you get that sort of that urge to breathe and you immediately panic and want to come up for air. So you really want to develop a tolerance to that early on. Okay, so a couple of people I recommend listening to would be, you've got the Noob Spiro podcast. He's got some great stuff, interviews some really experienced Spiro, so you can get a lot of really good tips from there. And from YouTube, I recommend Adam Freediver. He's an Australian uh, freediving champion, and he gives you a whole heap of tips for holding your breath, equalizing and whatnot. Uh, so he's been really helpful for me. All right, so next tip is, because you're going from the shore, that can actually be quite tricky and a lot more physically demanding than, for instance, sparing off of a boat because you've got to get through the waves. Sometimes you've got to go 100 meters out from shore. So my advice is to try and not do it too quickly. Conserve your energy, because when you get to the point where you want to dive on fish, you don't want to have a big buildup of lactic acid in your legs. Your breath hold will be really, really poor and you'll be a bit stressed out. Another tip, and this is one that I always break for myself, is try not to dive like every 30 seconds. It can be really tempting to do so as soon as you see a fish you wanna dive. Try and relax, work out where you wanna dive, and then only dive every couple of minutes or so, and that way you'll actually be able to dive for longer and have a more enjoyable time, rather than just going down and then up and down, and then up and down and then up the whole time. Now, what you're after is you're after usually structure in the water, that's where fish want to congregate, that's where they call home and where they feed. So if you're just on a beach with no rocks around, no reef, it's likely a lot of the fish that you're trying to hunt are not even going to be there. So we're looking for uh, bits of rock jutting out into the water, bits of uh, submerged reef, and what are called bommies, which are large, big, round areas of structure that fish like to congregate around. So that's what you're really after on your hunt. When you're down there, one of my best bits of advice when you're starting out is don't think about hunting at first. Go down there almost like you're snorkeling and trying to have a look at the fish life, the marine life. Go down there, scratch around on some coral, throw some sand up. You'll find very quickly some much larger, better fish start coming back towards you that you didn't even know were in the area because basically you spooked them. They saw you before you saw them and they left the area. When you go down and start to chill out, they realize you are not a threat or potentially even you've brought food for them. So they'll basically come back around. And often the only times I'll go out and I won't bring my spear gun, that's when I'll see the best fish and that's not coincidence. They know that you are not a threat. You're not acting in a threatening manner. If you are trying to go for a fish, if you've targeted one specific one, you're like, right, I'm gonna shoot that one for dinner. Don't stare it in the eye. Don't swim straight at it. Do not chase it. You need to learn each and every fish's behavior and that can be really hard, take a really, really long time. But my bit of advice would be try to intercept its swim path or go down and just try and relax towards the bottom. That fish may even come up to check you out. Sometimes even if you want to throw a little bit of sand up, certain types of fish like emperors that you might be wanting to get, they're a bit of a prize fish. They will actually swim right up towards you because they think that you're uh, bringing fish up from the bottom like a stingray would. Now I've briefly touched on this before, but if you're in really sharky waters like many parts of WA, I do not recommend you go out there and shoot a bunch of fish and have them on your float because you're kind of just asking to attract sharks in the area, okay? I've not had any bad run-ins at all, but just as a rule of thumb, and I think, you know, safety first sometimes, especially when you're out there on your own, which is incredibly dangerous, is if you shoot a fish, put it out of its misery with that knife and just get out of the water. Do what you need to do with the fish. Don't chuck its guts in, don't bleed it in the water. Uh, and then maybe go out a bit later on or go in somewhere different or it's just it's just trying to mitigate that risk of a shark uh, either getting aggressive because you've got a, a dead fish on you. Now I can't say I've been a knight in shining armor every time but ideally when you go out there I, I advise having the intent of owning, only shooting a fish that you are proud of that you can bring back to shore and be like yep look at this fish I've shot. I'm gonna eat it, it's gonna be a good feed. When I was very first starting out, I was pretty much just happy with any fish I could get to eat. Now, what you can do is you can buy uh, something where you can measure the sizes of the fish. You really wanna go out there and know what is the minimum legal size of a fish that you can shoot. 
general rule of thumb is that a fish in the water will look quite a bit larger than it actually is. I've unfortunately shot a couple of undersized fish. It's uh, not massively undersized, but enough where you're like, yeah, I shouldn't have shot this fish. It's still a juvenile. And that's just because you're learning out. Like everyone does make mistakes. I've never done that intentionally. Unfortunately, it's not like with lion fishing, you can't put that fish back in the water. It's dead. So I've taken out of the water and eaten it, but you really just want to try and mitigate that. Now, you're always going to see fish when you go out there and that can be really exciting at first. You're like, oh my gosh, this, it's a smorgasbord of fish out here. Most fish you don't want to be shooting. They're not going to be worth your trouble gutting them, um, filleting them, scaling them. Really, you want to have a rough idea of what are your fish that you want to be going for. And for me, I use an app called Rec Fish West, which is the WA fishing app. It gives you the rules and regulations, pictures and information about all the different fish. And you can just find that out online if you don't have an app for your area. But that's been a really a, a real gold mine for me and make sure that I'm legal and that we can sustain these fishing habits for years to come. Now, I hope this video has been somewhat helpful to you. I understand I am, again, like I say, by no means an expert. Many good sparrows have been sparing their entire life or for many, many, many years. It's not something you're going to be really good at straight away. So just think of it like a learning experience. It's a new skill. It's a bit of a new playground out there. Enjoy the hunt. Don't shoot everything you see. Put fish out of their misery. Make sure you eat the fish. I never will shoot a fish and use it to bait another fish. It's always just for food. Have fun out there. Please be safety conscious. Keep an eye on boats. If you're in sharky water, uh, be really aware of what you're doing. Um, it is all about risk mitigation. I am not encouraging you to go sparing because it is really dangerous, especially on your own. When you can, it is probably more enjoyable and obviously much safer to go with a buddy, but uh, sometimes beggars can't be choosers and it's just some risk that you're gonna have to take on board. But hopefully you got at least one or two tips out of this video. If you did, check out our vlogs if you haven't already. Uh, we do some pretty cool stuff all around Australia, my partner and I. And if you did get something out of the video, please subscribe because it really helps this new channel and flick me a thumbs up. Give me double dislikes uh, if I've told you something that you really disliked or just let me know in the comments.